This reaction here is a very specific and important reaction when it comes to measuring rates of reaction. It comes with its own method. The reaction is between sodium thiosulfate or thiosulfate as some people call it for short, but sodium thiosulfate Na2S2O3 with hydrochloric acid. This is an example of the initial rate method, okay? So what we're doing here is it's not a continuous measurement of rate of one reaction. Each reaction, we get one recording and it's the initial rate, okay? So this is an example of an initial rate method for rates of reaction. In summary, what we're doing is measuring the rate of reaction between sodium thiosulfate and hydrochloric acid using what's known as the initial rate method. What that means is we've got one result per run. So we'll run an experiment, okay, a reaction, and what we're doing is we're timing it to completion. So we get one result per run. We're not continually measuring something as the reaction proceeds from start to finish, like in the continuous rate method. What we're doing is we start the timer, when the reaction is finished, we stop it. And that's our initial rate method. So what's the reaction here? The reaction is essentially sodium thiosulfate plus two HCl. Oh, they're both aqueous, I should have written that, but they're both aqueous solutions. They react together to form two NaCl sodium chloride aqueous, sulfur dioxide gas, which doesn't smell very nice, and we shouldn't really be sniffing that, um, solid sulfur, okay, and water. Now it's this solid sulfur, this is a yellow solid, that is what's going to provide us with the end point for this reaction. So as the sulfur gets produced, it actually clouds the solution and becomes yellow. And that is how we're going to figure out when the end of the reaction is. Over here, this is our setup, simple conical flask. And what we've got is usually a card with a big fat black cross underneath it that the conical flask sits on. It was hard for me to draw that on here, okay? But we're sitting a conical flask on a piece of paper or a piece of card with a big black cross on it. So this black cross here, okay, we can see very, very clearly through the bottom of this glass conical flask, okay? In here, of course, these are our reactants, all right? So our sodium thiosulfate and our HCl. So you put one in, and then when you're ready to start, you put your other reactant in, and the reaction, of course, starts. As the reaction starts, what we're gonna get is solid sulfur actually being produced in this solution, so it's no longer clear. So solid sulfur produced, okay? And what that's going to do as we view from the top down, okay, so what we're doing is we start our timer when we've mixed our reactants, we look down the, the neck of the conical flask at that black cross when we can no longer see it because the solid sulfur is being produced, it clouds our view, literally. When you can't see the cross anymore, you stop your timer, okay? So that's what's happening in this reaction and it's the solid yellow sulfur that being produced that actually provides us with our endpoint and it stops us from seeing that cross. So let's make a note of the actual method here. First up, really importantly, with our method, we need to measure known volumes of reagents of known concentration because that's usually what we change here, okay? Either the concentration of the sodium thiosulfate, the concentration of the hydrochloric acid, the volumes have to remain the same though, okay? So we measure known volume of reagents of known concentration. When we're ready, what we do is we add our sodium thiosulfate to the flask and because the HCl is usually a smaller volume, we add that second. And once we've added our HCl, as soon as we've done that, we need to start the timer. Usually give it a quick swirl, then put it back down on the cross and obviously start your timer as soon as that HCl hits the uh, sodium thiosulfate in the flask. We stop our timer when the X is obscured by the sulfur so we can no longer see that black cross through the solution because of all that sulfur being produced. What we can do is we can go ahead and repeat that, okay, at, um, you know, just to get accurate results, reliable results. We can repeat each concentration that we're changing or whatever it is. But really what we're looking to do is change the independent variables. So you can get three readings for, let's say, each concentration of HCl if you want to. But what we do need to do is repeat changing that independent variable. So we can change concentration of acid, we can change concentration of sodium thiosulfate, 
or we could change the temperature at which this reaction is happening, in which case you need to put those separate solutions in a water bath maybe before the reaction starts. So you could do a, a, you know, a, a range of different temperatures and see how that affects the rate of reaction. And that is what we're going to focus on here. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna give you a set of results. I'm gonna talk about how we analyze those and what we can do with those results. When it comes to our analysis, we need to put a pretty hefty table together, okay? Like I said, if you've got repeats for each temperature that you're doing, then obviously, you know, you need to have a bigger table and put down the time taken for each of those repeats. But I'm just using an average here just to save a bit of time. So I've got temperature in my left-hand column, let's say 20, 30, 40. Obviously that can go all the way up to 70 or 80 maybe, okay? But 20, 30, 40, just to give you an idea. And of course you record the time taken for that cross to be obscured. Let's just assume that these times are averages for each temperature that I did in the experiment. So these times in seconds are 50 seconds at 20 degrees, 42 seconds at 30 degrees, and 26 seconds at 40 degrees. Now that makes sense because we should know by now that increase in the temperature increases the rate of a chemical reaction. So of course the time taken for that reaction to get to the point where you can't see the cross anymore, that time is gonna go down as the temperature goes up. That makes sense, okay? but we're not looking to measure the time taken for the reaction to happen here. What we're looking to do is measure the rate. Now the thing is, unlike a continuous rate method here, all we've got is a time. We're not measuring the mass of sulfur. We're not measuring the volume of sulfur dioxide gas given off. We've just got a time. And that's how long does it take for the reaction to get to that point. So what we need to do is just convert that time into a rate. And what we really need to do is invert it because of course, the faster the rate or the greater the rate, the shorter the time taken, they're inversely proportional. So what we do here with this initial rate method is we do one over T, one over time. This is what our last column is for. This is rate, one over T. So we literally put into our calculator one divided by 50, one divided by 42, one divided by 26. And we get these numbers, 0.0200, 0 0.0238 and 0 0.0385. So you can now see that the higher the temperature, the greater the rate. We've inverted that time. So that's what one over T is all about. So one over T is our rate, okay? So that's what we do with these initial rate methods like this one, where we've only got a time. That's what we do, we one over T and that's our rate. When it comes to plotting our results, Again, two axes, our y-axis here, that's gonna be rate. That's our dependent variable, isn't it? That's the thing we're measuring, and that's got to be one over t. Now, you're gonna be dealing with small numbers here, so whenever they get you to plot a graph in an exam, they're always gonna give you marks for figuring out what sort of scale you're going to use, so make sure you practice that. Across the bottom, of course, what we've got is our independent variable, which in this case is temperature, okay? It might be changing concentration of the acid, or it might be changing concentration of sodium thiosulfate, that's fine, but your independent variable, whatever it is, goes across the bottom. With temperature, a typical plot is going to look like this. So what we've got is obviously rate increasing as we increase temperature, but it is pretty exponential. Rate is massively affected by an increase in temperature, okay? What they say is that rate is doubled for every 10 degrees Celsius of temperature you increase it by, okay? So rate doubles for every 10 degrees you increase the temperature by. So it is an exponential relationship between changing temperature and rate. And that's what you're going to get there, okay? So you can literally just read this graph. You don't have to get a gradient or anything like that. If they ask you, what's the rate of reaction at 35 degrees? Once you've got your plot, you can just read the graph find 35 on the x-axis, read it across, and find your rate from there. So that's all we have to do. So that's our initial rate method. This one's very specific to this reaction because we're producing sulfur, okay? So we're measuring the initial rate. Like I said, we're not continuously measuring the production of sulfur over time. We're literally like, oh, how long does it take to get to a certain point? So that's why it's known as an initial rate method. We follow that method, we get our uh, results here, of course, repeating as necessary, finding our averages, and then what we do is one over T, and that's our rate. We plot that graph at different temperatures, and again, no gradient needed here. We can just read to find the rate of reaction from this graph. One thing I didn't have room to write on here were errors, sources of error for this. 
There are measurement errors and stuff that comes down to human error, so on and so forth. It could be the swirling of the flask. You've got to make sure you just swirl it a couple of times and put it down and leave it, okay? Or don't swirl it at all. You've got to maintain consistency with that. But the biggest source of error in this, bar none, is again a human error. You're viewing through this at that black cross. Now, some people might say, oh, I can still see the cross. Another person that's looking at it might be, well, I can't see it anymore. So it is down to human error there, okay? So your perception, which is a really important word, your perception of whether you can see the cross or not is flawed because we are human after all. So viewing the cross, okay, your perception of whether you can see the cross or your perception of the end point is the biggest source of error in this, okay? So if you're ever asked about that, number one thing you should write down, your perception of the end point may change, okay? So that's what's the biggest error here. But your method is pretty straightforward. It's just how you deal with it and how you analyze those results is what's really important. So that's sodium thiosulfate and HCl, an example of an initial rate method.